My name is uh, Espen Barteide. I am uh, Minister of uh, Climate and Environment in uh, Norway. Uh, very happy to be with you here at the World Energy Policy Summit. Uh, I was for many years the energy spokesperson for the Labour Party in Parliament, and now we are in government. And uh, this question is very high on the agenda uh, of uh, my ministry, and of course also the Ministry of Energy, with whom I, very, I work very closely. Welcome, uh, Barteide. Very honored to have you uh, here. Um, we uh, see that the climate crisis is very high on the agenda, naturally. Uh, but we also see that, globally speaking, uh, the energy crisis is also a very real threat for the, the three billion people who approximately experience lack of energy. So um, how can we convert these two crises into a new economic, social and political opportunity for humanity? <laughs> well, first, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and this question is, uh, is a really large question, but it's one of the most important questions in the world, literally speaking, because we simply have to solve uh, both. Uh, we need to make sure that we uh, keep global warming uh, un under acceptable limits, and uh, the global policies to make that happen are getting stronger and stronger, and we see a major shift in the economy. We see investors and innovators and large uh, uh, corporations, organizations, uh, companies, consumers care more about, about this. So we need to change the use of energy uh, gradually and systematically towards uh, low and eventually zero emission. But as you very correctly say, we also need to make sure that uh, people do not only maintain an access to energy, but that new people get access to energy. So we need to combine the two and we need to think about them as mutually compatible and mutually reinforcing. And for instance, the uh, development of uh, renewable power, power sources like solar um, it, it promises to be helpful in both respects. It can both replace some of the fossil fuel generated uh, power that we are using today, but it can also be a very good starting ground for new areas which have not been connected to the grid and which now will start getting electricity because it's scalable. You can begin with a few panels and then you can grow and only much later you need to connect to a, a grid. So it's actually very good for development of the poorer parts of the world. So we need to address this as a challenge for the rich for the developing countries and for the poorer countries uh, alike. And is there maybe a difference in how one can uh, take on both challenges depending on where you are in the world? Well, you could say that uh, in one sense, uh, the most advanced economies uh, will often have a certain advantage because uh, it's, uh, it may be easier to get the technological you know, to, to do the te technological leap into the new. But that advantage is being reduced because as new forms of energy develop, they also get cheaper and more available uh, and scalable, which means, uh, you know, when people have invested in the development of uh, uh, renewable sources like wind power and uh, solar power, we see the unit price fall. Uh, they started expensive and they're getting less expensive. Uh, when people are also have invested now for decades actually into the use uh, of uh, renewables in, let's say, transport by electric cars, they started expensive, they're getting cheaper. These technologies are there. So they, of course, they can be, they can transcend boundaries and, and transcend uh, economies. So in a sense, the problem is gradually being solved because the the cost of going cleaner is going down. So the relative cost is going cleaner. Of course, some of these energy sources are actually competing today with fossil. The problem tends to be not their uh, availability, but to ensure that they're available all the time. Because as everybody knows, the, you, you will only get sun power when the sun shines and wind power when the wind blows. So how do you balance this? How do you develop sort of the uh, storage capacity? How do you combine different uh, 
different sources into one. It, it was easier when we could just uh, start up a coal fire plant, put in coal, fire up and take out what you needed. So it's not more expensive uh, to do the clean thing any longer, but it's slightly more, it, it requires more organization and an organization over a wider area. If, for instance, you need to connect an area where you have wind with an area where you have sun and balance with solar or natural gas. Mm. Uh, Norway being a big energy producer and far ahead in taking on the challenge of uh, climate change, uh, has Norway any answers to the intermittency issues of the electricity grid and the things you are... So, so Norway, I think seen from India or from the outside, <laughs> Norway might seem as a paradoxical country because the, on the one hand we have a very early uptake in, in the use of renewable energy. Our, our, uh, our power system is almost totally renewable because of a very high penetration of hydro, because of our topography. We have a lot of mountains, a lot of water uh, and also uh, wind power. And also in the use, we are seeing an increasing electrification, which is ahead of most countries, which means the degree to which we are electrified is growing. At the same time, our main source of income is selling oil and gas. So how do the, all this fit together? And the answer is, we believe that all of us, the world, and our region Europe and the, our country Norway needs to have a strategic path for moving from A to B, going from a still rather fossil intensive energy system to a clean energy system. Uh, and, and in that travel, I think there are two fruits that are both absolutely true <laughs> at the same time. One is we have to do it. The other one is it's really complicated <laughs> and it will take time. And then we need to recognize both. I mean, we need to be honest on the fact that we have to get there. And we have to get there remembering that more people need to get into, uh, you know, get access to energy. Uh, but we also have to recognize that it's a, tr it's, a, it's a journey. And on this journey, we have to go from the most polluting to the less polluting sources. You can't just switch from coal heavy, oil heavy, gas heavy, and overnight to a totally renewable system. You don't have the sources, you don't have the regulation of intermittency, and you don't have the use, uses. In our own country, of course, we have the unique advantage that most of our energy is hydro, and hydro shares with coal, nuclear, and gas the advantage that you can turn it on and off and you can regulate, which you cannot do with the others. So, that's really a, a blessing for us, which, of course, not all countries can copy. Our hydroelectric dams are the world's biggest batteries, in a sense, and, and the world's cheapest batteries per storage capacity, uh, but not everybody can do that. So, I think the research front in the coming years and decades will be how do you manage intermittency, how do you uh, store and how do you balance different systems. I, I believe that smart grids that connect different sources uh, with automation and um, uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and uh, big data which where you know how the consumer behaves and so on is a big part of the answer. I don't think the problem is to get enough renewable, but is to make sure you have it at the right time, all the time and at the right price. Um, looking into the net zero uh, scenarios, we see that uh, even in a very positive uh, outlook, um, oil, gas and coal will still uh, remain an um, important part of the energy system at all. Um, but, and seen from uh, maybe the most energy poor countries in the world, um, they see that uh, these energy sources are being demonized, maybe in the rich uh, countries. Uh, especially, uh, how can we build a new global climate order with a real new industry in a conducive atmosphere? Yeah, well, I, I understand the question, which is a fair question. I don't think it's so much about demonization, but it's simply we need to recognize that we have, uh, there's very little carbon budget left in the world. I, I mean, we have basically emitted what we can emit and, and we can go on like this for a few more years, but not much longer. And one of the main sources of, uh, not the only by all means, but a primary source of uh, CO2 emissions and other climate gases is 
energy, fossil energy, and with uh, you know coal being the worst, and then comes oil, and then comes natural gas, but they're all emitting. So, as I said, you need an idea of the journey towards something else. But you also need to understand that you can't just switch overnight. You have to, nice. you can't pull the plug. So, so of course, one one answer is carbon capture and storage. That you some of this can be solved by actually taking out the emissions, so you can continue to use the storage, maybe in the transitionary period. Mm -hmm. I know some people are looking into this even for coal. Uh, in our case, it's a, it's a big theme on on gas because you could actually m turn natural gas into a zero emission product through carbon capture and storage. Uh, the technology is being developed, it's not here really now. I mean, we know it works, but it's not here on scale and on the economy. So, so one answer is, of course, to try to um, reduce emissions from fossil sources. And the other direction is to reduce the dependency on, on, uh, on fossil sources. And then also to make sure that you move from the more polluting or admitting to the less admitting ones overweight so that you're more efficient in, in, in the use even of fossil fuels. Um, it's, it's a really big question. It's a really important question, but we simply, we simply have to get it done. And we, we have, <laughs> sometimes when I work on this, I think, you know, the direction of travel is promising. You know, we're getting there. It's moving in the right direction. There's more and more development into these renewables and also into carbon capture and storage and so on. But the problem is that the speed is too slow. So we don't, we, we, we need to shorten the technological time for change uh, to fit better with the time nature can allow us to still admit. Because I would very much warn, and, and, and speaking to uh, 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 illustrious uh, Indian audience with people who are deep into this, I would warn against arguing that anyone has a right to admit. I mean, I think we have a collective problem, but solving that collective problem has to be fair. So those of us who have benefited most from becoming rich in the fossil age have to help those who are currently undergoing economic development or currently poor to become wealthy, rich, and be able to take good care of the population without copying what went wrong in our uh, time. And that, uh, that's about redistribution of wealth but it's also uh, 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 and money, but also about transfer of technology and willingness to cooperate, which goes way beyond what we have done so far. And it's very high on our government's agenda that we are increasing substantively, and we announced this in Glasgow, that we substantively increase uh, climate funding uh, as part of our development uh, assistance. And within climate funding, which of course also goes to uh, mitigating uh, uh, and, and uh, efforts, um, we focus on energy transition and helping countries to transition faster, among other things, by guaranteeing early investments and by transfer of technology. Many are speaking of uh, the climate changes being visible in the south. And, uh, but uh, are you seeing any uh, visible signs of this in Norway? Has the climate already changed? Big time. And actually, uh, wh while you might see some of the most dramatic consequences for people has been where you have large populations in the same place where a flood has massive consequences because there's simply so many people there. Maybe their dwellings are not really able to sustain the shock of massive water. But we who are close to the North Pole, uh, at least relative to <laughs> India, uh, we see this com the, the global warming on the Spitsbergen Peninsula is like 10 degrees or more. It, it's, it's colossal uh, because 1.1 degrees, which is one, we are between 1.1 and 1.2 degrees so far over uh, pre-industrial times on the planet. But in, in all parts of the world, it's much, much more. So we really see it. We really see it. I mean, we see in, in Spitsbergen, just like in Russia, we have uh, buildings built on permafrost, believing that permafrost is permafrost, <laughs> but now it's not perma permanent any longer, and it collapses. Roads and infrastructure. Um, we see reindeer in Finnmark, which is the very north of Norway, not getting access to their food because uh, milder temperatures has changed the whole ecosystem around them. So we see big a big time you don't need to be uh, close to the equator we see it big time coming and we know it's coming faster and faster also dramatic weather floods too much water in some places 
uh, to Little Water and other places, uh, earth erosion. And, and we are actually just updating our strategy so how to deal with this, because even if we are super successful, more than anybody really thinks we can be in fulfilling every pledge in the Paris Agreement, the climate is still changing and is getting worse and is coming faster and faster. And, and we also have these tipping points, which we need to be aware of. It's not a linear development. Um, the ocean is about to, you know, the capacity of the ocean to absorb climate gases is almost done, it's almost full. Uh, when, when we see ice melting, it means we have less white spaces reflecting light and it will more, more heat will be absorbed. And so when we see, when, when you both have more humidity, higher temperature means more humidity, as everyone in India very well knows, that means more water in the same place. Uh, and when the wind changes, you can have these colossal downpours of water in one place which never ends because although previously it would continue with the wind. These changes destroys our economy in a generation or two. So we really have to act. But we really have to act understanding that people have different starting points and we need to help each other on the planet. Uh, rounding up, I have one final question for you, uh, delving more into the EV, EV example. I know that uh, our uh, uh, host in India is very curious on uh, what was the story behind or, or the recipe Norway used for getting such positive uh, deployment of EV cars uh, throughout the, the carpool of Norway? Yeah, exactly. Let me first say, in the, in the last statistic I saw, which was the end of last year, uh, in new car sales, we were around 70%, 70% of fully EV. Uh, uh, just 8% were, uh, were fossil and, um, and a few 20 something percent in the middle were hybrid, but it's going towards EV. And how did we get there? Well, the starting point was uh, we had high taxes on cars. So by simply saying we will not apply any of these taxes on EV cars, it, we got an indirect subsidy. We didn't pay anything. I mean, it wasn't, the government didn't give people money, but it refused, it did not take money. <laughs> it didn't take the tax on cars. So that made them relatively inexpensive compared to what they would have been in the market. And then with the volume, we contributed together with the other countries that, you know, we contributed to developing the technology. So EV cars are now close to becoming uh, on pair when you when you look at performance uh, per price to fossil cars and it will soon be a much better car in all respects I mean cheaper better more effective uh, more energy effective and so on and when that happens then what happened that then what I predict with a high degree of certainty is then suddenly everybody wants to have an EV car provided there's infrastructure because then the next problem is that you need to charge your EV car and most Norwegians we, we live live in houses in uh, you know not 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 in apartments in the city but in houses and that means you have electricity at home you charge your car at home so every morning you start with a full charge the challenge then is that you want to go somewhere and go back then you need charging stations so you need to build the infrastructure but if you get the if you get the infrastructure right eventually this will take over the market and i think it's the dominant form in the future and i'm proud to say that we didn't believe it would be that successful. I mean, it's more successful than we dreamt about when we started doing it. Now we're seeing that it's beginning to work in the market without in, uh, subsidies, but we are really there, but we'll be there in a few years. And maybe part of that uh, story uh, is also there was really a big political consensus going into uh, these changes. Uh, why is that? How the, come everyone must agree that we will uh, not take this money from the cars that is EV and... And that's actually an extremely important question because this required a long-term constant policy. Mm -hmm. Because if this was oscillating between one government says yes, one says no, it would never have happened. So it was precisely an example, and very good you pointed out, that you we established it, it was agreed, and every single government since we started has said we are committed to this policy it will be good in the long run and, uh, and and that's something i'm proud of because it's good in these polarized times that we're able to agree on some things and i think that the green shift if you want it both to be green and to produce 
benefit for people, you know, benefits in you know, cleaner air and so on, but also jobs and uh, opportunity. Uh, you need some constant consistency over time. So to try to agree on something that is uh, above the daily uh, competition and politics is sometimes extremely helpful. And then I hope it can be a source of inspiration to others because you get, in addition to removing the emissions, you get a lot of other benefits. You get cleaner cities. Uh, we, we notice, I mean, I live in Oslo, it is simply a much cleaner city after most people got electric cars. I can feel it. The, the, the frequency of asthma goes down. Uh, more people remain alive who would otherwise have died from air pollution. So, so there's a lot of positive sides to this. And, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes a lot of good things comes in a package and the EV revolution helps doing that. It should be said, however, that an EV car is still a car. It still, still takes space. So it does not pre exclude the need for, you know, for metro systems and buses and bike lanes and all the other things, but, uh, and walking. But, uh, but uh, as long as we will need cars, I think it's good that they become EV. Thank you, Mr. Bartade. Great to talk to you. And a nice way to round up our discussion, uh, hearing a very inspirational story on that industrial change is really possible. And uh, hopefully we'll see that going into both the European and the world uh, car systems uh, in the years to come. And absolutely. And thank you for, and as a final line for me, just say, you know, I think the most unfair thing we could do was to leave behind people or regions of the planet in a 20th century economy that the rest of the world leaves behind. Fairness today is actually about making sure everybody's part of the change because change is coming. Thank you.